my interest in uh, all things Catholic. Uh, um, those elements have showed up in my other films, Mean Streets, Taxi Driver to a certain extent, uh, Raging Bull certainly, and many pictures. Um, but I think I approached it uh, from different ways. Uh, uh, the idea of um, um, the tenets or the uh, beliefs of Christianity uh, in the everyday life that we lead. You know. And so ultimately, I was given the Book of Silence in 1988. It was in August, I believe, or September, uh, by Archbishop Paul Moore, who is the uh, Archbishop of, um, uh, Episcopal Archbishop of New York, St. John the Divine. He was a supporter of the film I had just made, Last Temptation of Christ, uh, after seeing the film. And so uh, he talked to us about um, a serious discussion about uh, those, those elements in that particular film and those, those arguments, those, those uh, 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 concepts, uh, those questions. And then he said, um, I have a book for you that you should take a look at. Um, uh, it takes the very essence of uh, what you were trying for in, in your, other, your other films and goes, goes deeper. The issue in this particular story and that should apply to everything we know of today, too. And that is the cultural differences, right? Uh, how, how do you deal? How do they deal with the uh, cultural differences of uh, Japan as opposed to Western Europe in the 17th century? Um, uh, they have to understand the culture that they're bringing this gospel, this good news to. They have to understand what the values of the culture are. They have to understand the way people think. The only way to do that is to be with them know the language, spend time, and then see, then see. And I think the only way they really, uh, it really could work is if their actions are something which uh, um, uh, the people would want to emulate, how they behave. I think that's the key. And it, it, isn't, it doesn't have to do with stepping on a fumier, or it, it's how they relate to the people around them and the love and the compassion they bring. That's the key. The world has changed so much that um, I think the more serious films, there, there are many being made, but I don't know if they're being as supported as they used to be. When I come from a time where they were supported strongly, uh, not all of them, but they were. Um, and look, the world has changed. Technology has changed. Um, the way people view films have changed, where they view them. Uh, what is, what is a film anyway at this point? Is it a two-hour picture? Is it six hours? Is it 20 minutes? It, it, it's become, it's wide open, which is good, and it's also dangerous, but it's also a new opportunity. So what happens is that the serious films get made, I believe, but they're not supported in terms of budget. And I don't think the filmmakers are um, nurtured enough, I think. Nurtured enough, and so I'm concerned uh, that uh, um, that um, many of these filmmakers, uh, you should be able. Like, well, at the time years ago in the '70s, uh, Bob Altman would make a film a year, maybe a fi two films a year, you know, um, lower budgets, but he still was able to get them out. Um, and here now, I find that some of the younger filmmakers who are, who are distinctly uh, uh, personal filmmakers have trouble getting the money to put pictures together. I mean, not all of them do, but a lot of them, a lot of them do. And uh, but you know, the Academy, for example, give the Academy Award to Twelve Years a Slave or Spotlight. These are independent pictures. These are serious pictures, you know. So uh, there is that element. I just feel that that I came from a time when they were all serious. <laughs> it took so many years to get. The silence made uh, for so many reasons. And at, during that time, we looked at different areas of the world. And we started with the real places in Japan where Shushiko Endo's novel took place in Nagasaki, uh, a small village called Satomi, which in the movie is Tomoji, Unzen Hot Springs, uh, so many others. But we didn't film there because it would it, be too expensive. So in addition to Japan, Production designer Dante Ferretti went to New Zealand, scouted it, Vancouver, Northern California, and finally Taiwan. 
Um, we even, I even realized we went to some places in the in American the American South. But he realized right away that this this is where we could make the picture. The, the landscape was very, very similar. It had so much to offer Taiwan. Uh, the coastlines were untouched. Uh, the land itself, the landscapes were quite extraordinary. And, and we had a crew of over 750 people. And it was made up of Taiwanese, Japanese, Australians, Italians, British, and Americans. Um, and uh, yes, it was complex and uh, confusing for a little while at first. <laughs> there were language barriers, a lot of cultural differences. However, you know, everyone really wanted to make this picture, and they adapted so quickly, and, and we became um, uh, blended and like a determined family. Really, is we all they were all devoted to helping me and 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 you know really bring this picture to life on every level. Liam Neeson and I worked together before on Gangs of New York. Uh, Karen Hines, I've, I've always admired. He's, he's an extraordinary actor, a great great actor, really. So much so I don't even know he's in which I I've seen him in movies and I say who's that guy and it's always the same guy. It's Karen Hines. Hines. So <laughs> I never recognize. He, he's so extremely. Uh, immersed in the character he plays, you know, um, and uh, I, I find him to be amazing. Andrew and Adam were new to me. I, I mean, I'd seen Andrew in Social Network and the Red Riding film and Boy A, I think, and Adam in the Noah Baumbach movie and, um, well, and Girls, and, and, and I really loved him and I loved his work. Uh, and I took the work very seriously uh, threw themselves into the roles they say actually actually uh, really involve certain hardships uh, one of which besides going to uh, uh, travel in Portugal and uh, going on retreat in Wales uh, religious retreat and all this sort of thing uh, but when it got to do the picture they really had to be extremely thin and they had to eat very very little during the shooting and we had a nutritionist with us, but but it was it was a uh, uh, physical hardship. And and Andrew actually um, went through the um, and completed the spiritual exercises with the Jesuits. Uh, this uh, Father James Martin, uh, who helped him through that, which is an extraordinary achievement. Many of the the Japanese actors I'd known and I admired for years in other films. Tadanabu Asano uh, plays the translator, uh, and I'd seen him in pictures by Kiyoshi Kurosawa in Ichi the Killer, Mike's film, uh, in uh, Shinji Aoyama's films, uh, in Mongol, and I, I mean, I've always loved his work. Um, Shinji Tsukamoto, I knew really as a filmmaker. He's brilliant, brilliant director. He made incredibly visceral films. Uh, Tetsuo, the... Um, the Iron Man, Electric Dragon, uh, a film called A Snake of June, which is um, avant-garde, beautiful. Uh, in fact, the woman in it, Akira, uh, the woman in Asuna Kurosawa, she plays the wife of Andrew at the end of the film in, in our picture. Uh, he is a, a very independent filmmaker. He's so independent now, he just shoots his own stuff, edits his own stuff. Uh, his latest picture was Fires on the Plane, which was shown in Venice a couple of years ago. Uh, but he's a remarkable, remarkable person and artist. Uh, Yoshi Oida was new to me. He's actually written many books on acting. He's worked with Peter Brook for 40 years. Um, uh, Yotsuke Kobutsuka. Uh, he played Kichichiro. And also seen him and admire him in many films. Um, uh, but his key, he, what, what clicked there with, with Yotsuke was, was the audition. He was he was uh, clear, precisely, right on, and it's a hard role to uh, to cast, but we got it with him. We knew it in that audition. And then there's Issei Ogata, plays the Inquisitor, and he's somebody I admired for many years. Ever since I saw him in uh, Yi Yi by Edward Yang, uh, where he plays a Japanese businessman, and he in Alexander Sukarov's film The Sun, S U N in which he plays uh, Emperor Hirohito in the last few days of the war and his uh, meetings with MacArthur. He's, he's extraordinary. Uh, and each of these actors brought um, 
more than their artistry. They just brought themselves to the part so much that uh, it was very moving. Rodriguez is uh, somebody who, uh, in a sense, gives up his faith to gain his faith, and that's the paradox. And when we were getting ready to make the picture, I realized that I was trying to create something that had been with me for many years since I was a teenager and when I first wanted to make movies. So I, as I said earlier, I'd studied for the priesthood, uh, didn't make it, uh, realized early on that it wasn't my calling. It's certainly a vocation, but it wasn't mine. Um, it was the calling of someone I had admired, a priest, a neighborhood priest who taught, taught us a lot. I wanted to be like him, but that's not the reason to be a priest. And I had this other calling, I guess, and it was making movies. And I had an idea to make a picture about a priest, actually, many years ago. Uh, a priest who had the calling, but who needed to take that extra step of getting past his ego and his spiritual pride, because it's the parishioners that have to come first, always. And I realized that this was the picture I was making, in a sense, while I was, while I was making it, really, while I was shooting it. Uh, I mean, I touched on this before, Mean Streets and certain other pictures, but, you know, here I was, um, well, 60 years later, dealing with the theme that has been with me since I was so young. So, Rodriguez and, and to a certain extent, Garupe have to get through themselves. They have to get past themselves and their pride. They have to give it up. They have to give up their egos. They have to be selfless. They have to lose the self, right? Both of them have the illusion that they'll be able to define their own spiritual paths, but of course, um, it's never the case. I planned to take many shots of nature in different ways. I planned, I planned so much over the years. But when I got to the locations, I, something happened. I, I realized that if we were able to get the equipment there, because some of these locations are very hard to get to, um, the landscape itself said a great deal. And so placing the actors within that landscape, placing the, uh, the different figures, so to speak, uh, it revealed itself to me while I was preparing the picture. And very often on set, too, very often on the location where we were shooting. Uh, uh, getting some experience from shooting a couple of TV pilots to move fast, um, I began to strip away things there, too, not needing a certain angle, not needing an extra angle here, uh, concentrating on uh, what the landscape, what the, the hillside looked like, or the mountainside, the mist that came and, and uh, went uh, uh, mysteriously, um, the color of the grass, um, the shapes of the rocks, the ocean, the waves, the caves, all of this, uh, the mud, the extraordinary amount of mud um, that we even shot in a typhoon, we shot in the heat. I mean, it, it was a very, very uh, arduous shoot. Um, a lot of mountain climbing uh, and some very unpredictable weather, let alone some earthquakes, but aside from that... <laughs> Um, there was a studio that we worked in in Taipei. Um, but, you know, once again, the style of the picture has half the picture there's incarceration is in a prison cell. A cell, granted, it has bars you could see through. You could see right Wooden bars. And that um, helped me define in my mind visually what was important to see it from Rodriguez's point of view. Nine films I've done with Dante and his wife, Francesca. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's a genius of what he does. Uh, uh, he was also able to create something from nothing, really. You know, um, if he's given the ability to create something bigger and uh, financially uh, given the, uh, the, the support, that's something else. But he can also come up with something uh, that we need uh, with that very special eye that he has and sense of design, which, which really also works out to be something that's accurate and for the period, you know? So we just know each other that way. We worked, I've always admired his work on all the other films he's made. Uh, and um, he went through a lot of hardships to make this picture. 
but he came through. Uh, he did some beautiful work. This is the second time I worked with, or third time I worked with Rodrigo Prieto. Uh, and <laughs> he was another, uh, he was another person in the sense that once we got the camera in that position, we felt that uh, the image was telling us more than what we thought. And he would go with that. Um, the key thing, his lighting is, is, uh, is, uh, subtle and uh, uh, sensitive is tone on set is something which is um, supportive um, with humor but at the same time uh, not necessarily phased by all the crises um, and so uh, the temperament is good but but uh, the ability to try different things the ability to to say, well, can't we have the camera fly over there like a Wolf of Wall Street and fly? And he'd work it out, you know. Um, I, I'm very lucky, I think, to have a good relationship with him, and he's a wonderful artist, great artist.